I am not a licensed instructor. This is not intended for real-world use and is not a substitution for real-world instruction. This video is intended for flight simulation only. What's up guys, Ronnie back, and this time with somewhat of a how-to or tutorial video? That's right, today I'm going over the all-important landing. For this video, it's assumed that your aircraft is on final already, and that you have it in landing configuration. What is a landing configuration, you ask? Your landing configuration is flaps down and gear down, if applicable, to the aircraft. Some aircraft don't have any flaps or gear to ensure is in the down and locked position, like this Cub here. With no flaps and fixed landing gear, your landing configuration in something like this is much simpler, and all you'll need to do is manage power for slow flight. As I say other terms related to landing, I'll do my best to define them for you throughout this video. But for now, let's get into landing some aircraft. Landing an aircraft can be more challenging than any other segment of flight. Generally speaking, no two landings are ever the same either. Between weather and the wide array of runway lengths and widths and or approach obstructions, landing an airplane can be intimidating even to an experienced pilot. Lucky for us on the simulators, we can control some of that intimidation factor by setting whether clear or fair and going to an airport with a nice, big runway to practice technique. Every landing follows a similar set of steps. You will always reduce power, flare, touch down, and roll out to every single landing you do. This goes for the smallest aircraft all the way to the biggest. When you reduce power, which should be at about the time you cross the usable runway threshold, it should be a nice and easy power back to idle. No abrupt movements except those necessary to remain in control of the aircraft. This power back to idle before your flare is a pretty universal step across 99% of the aircraft will be flying. We aren't talking about tail hooks and deck cables here. These next few steps in landing happen kind of fast. So fast, in fact, that once power is reduced, the rest can, in some cases, merge together as one step. After power is reduced to idle, there is usually a small moment before the flare. We are pretty slow in a GA aircraft. Your flare is when you raise the nose just before touchdown. How far you raise the nose varies by aircraft and weight, for most GA aircraft, general rule of thumb is to raise the nose to that of a nose-up attitude. Wait, attitude? Yes. When talking about attitude in an aircraft, it's not referring to how much lip the wife is giving you, rather, the orientation of the aircraft with respect to the horizon. This nose-up attitude is to ensure the main gear touch down first. While on the subject of the flare, I'd like to make a side note here. When referencing real-life general aviation landings, and even through experience in and around real-world aviation myself, it's clear many of the pilots, once they flare, are what they call on the stall horn when the main gear touches the pavement. In the real world, this isn't always an indication the aircraft has stopped flying at that moment, as aircraft manufacturers in the real world design a buffer of a few knots or so to give the pilot just a moment's warning that an impending stall is coming, so they can react appropriately. AKA, the aircraft is going to stop flying and start falling. I mention this because in sim, generally, a stall horn means falling. Like a rock dropped from a roof, falling. When you flare in the simulator with your little GA ready to land, it's okay not to hit the stall horn. The idea is to achieve the next step, touchdown, at as slow of an airspeed as possible. 
Again, with a GA aircraft, hold your flare so you remain just above the runway. As you hold it off with power at idle, you slow your airspeed and eventually you'll be eased into touchdown right from the flare. In holding the aircraft off the runway to get as slow as possible, you may very well be on the stall horn as they say in the real world. This is also okay to practice in sim, just be mindful of your height above the surface as a stall horn in the sim is a much less forgiving monster than in the real world. It doesn't mean you've gone and messed up your landing in the event you do hear the stall horn though, so don't get discouraged if you do. The main landing gear can actually take a pretty decent amount of force before absolute failure. That was a lot of flaring for a small aircraft, so the bigger aircraft at the flare stage must be worse, right? Actually, you may be surprised to find it somewhat easier to land a jet if you aren't factoring in what it takes to set a jet like that up to land. If talking from power back to rollout during landing, meaning the jet is already in its landing configuration, computers are set, and everything is stable, it's actually a much simpler process. Power back in a jet or prop liner is done generally between 50 and 30 feet. This power back is a very gradual reduction, and if done by the book, will just hit idle as the main gear touch down. Since we are flying faster in this stage of landing than GA aircraft, the few moments that you had before flare in the Cessna feel like nothing in a jet. After power back, be ready for the flare in an airliner. Unlike a general aviation aircraft where we hold the flare for as long as possible, you are actually flying an airliner onto the runway. We aren't playing with stall horns or holding the aircraft off the runway when flaring a jet. The flare maneuver in an airliner is solely to reduce the descent rate and not about slowing the aircraft. Without getting too in-depth in airliner-specific systems, when landing an airliner, either the pilot or the onboard flight computers calculate the best landing reference speed, as it's commonly referred as. This V-Rev speed is typically a decent margin away from the aircraft stall speed and also well within main gear structural limitations. And if we held the flare in a jet, you would probably flow all the way down the runway and possibly into whatever obstacle was on the other side. If you did manage to slow enough, your pitch attitude, again that attitude word, would be too great and a tail strike would almost be guaranteed. We don't want anything but the main gear to touch down first. Your flare in an airliner is only about 5 to 10 degrees, give or take, depending on the aircraft, payload, speed, weather, etc. So unlike this long drug out flare process in the little guys, the big guys just need a little pitch in the flare to slow the descent rate to ideally under 300 feet per minute. It is okay to land at greater than one foot per minute descent rate, and your landing rate isn't always the final deciding factor on what is a good landing. So far for both airliners and general aviation, we have gone over power back and flare. After the flare, both experience the touchdown stage. Here, it is crucial to ensure the main gear make contact first and that the nose gear does not slam into the ground. As the aircraft slows, it's important to get the nose gear on the ground as quickly as possible, but without letting it fall too fast. This may require more back pressure to control the speed at which the nose is coming down. In a GA aircraft, after the nose gear has touched down, we continue the rollout with power at idle, using minimal braking to safely achieve a taxiway exit off the runway. In a jet and most turboprop aircraft, however, you don't typically stay at idle thrust after touchdown during the rollout, and usually engage thrust reversers with a combination of an auto braking system in most jets to slow to a safe taxi speed to exit the runway. 
generally reverse thrusters are brought back to idle around the 60 to 80 knot mark and toe braking can be utilized from here safely. I'm kind of a sucker for the reverse thrust so I tend to ride mine out a little longer, I can't help it. From here stay at idle thrust and use brakes to control deceleration until you are at a safe enough speed to pull off the runway. Of course, there is one type of aircraft that may require some special technique. Going back to the GA scene, we can't talk about a landing tips and tricks video without the massively intimidating tail dragger. Landing a tail dragger is like convincing the significant other that you were right in the argument. Though, not impossible, it is quite a chore to maintain control and not ground loop as it's commonly referred. When landing a tail dragger, you have two touchdown options. The first is referred to as a wheel landing. This is when you touch down a little fast and only on the main nose wheels. The tail of the aircraft is still considered flying on touchdown using the wheel landing technique. Using this method, it is easiest to bounce a tail dragger. This happens when you touch down a little too hard and or too fast and the force of the impact pushes the tail down, thus raising the nose, and you're off the runway again. Reflexes want to take over when you bounce, and the natural response is to push forward on the controls to bring the nose back down. When that input is applied, reflexes can sometimes cause us to overcorrect the situation, thus causing the issue with the bouncing to not only repeat, but sometimes even magnified to the point of structural damage or failure of the landing gear occurring. When I practice these landings in sim, I manage power all the way to touchdown. I make sure I'm trimmed so that just a tiny bit of back pressure is required to maintain my desired pitch. And as soon as the main gear makes contact, I gently reduce the back pressure so the nose comes down just slightly from what it was as the weight of the aircraft settled onto the landing gear. Once we are stable on the ground, in most cases a lot more rudder than a tricycle type aircraft is going to need to be used to keep the aircraft straight. It is crucial to ensure the aircraft stays on the straight and narrow. As the aircraft slows, the tail should drop gently. Use elevator to control how fast the tail drops if needed. As you roll down the runway, excessive brakes can easily make a good touchdown a bad landing. If the runway allows, let the tailwheel drop before using any tow brakes. The second and generally my preferred method of landing a tail dragger is by using the three-point landing. This is the slow, nose-high method, and the goal is to touch down on all three wheels at the same time. When you cross the usable runway threshold, this time reduce power to idle. We want to flare similar to that of a tricycle gear aircraft, and the idea is to hold the aircraft off of the runway until we are at about the pitch we would be at just sitting on the ground. As tail draggers sit nose high, we want to try and match that same on the ground pitch when doing a three point landing. It's okay to land slightly more on the main gear than the tail wheel. The main thing we don't want to do with a three-point landing is put all of the weight of the aircraft on the tail wheel. It's better to be more on the nose gear than the tail wheel. With the landing being so slow and the tail already being low, using brakes carefully right after touchdown is generally okay. The three-point landing is also the preferred method to land in a tight spot or on a short or small runway because you aren't carrying all the extra speed that you have when doing a wheel landing. We are also able to use more brake pressure sooner and that always helps in tight spots. With all landings, you want to be as centered on the runway as you can be, but no pilot is perfect. And if you aren't exactly on center line, that's okay. If you touch down on the runway and center line falls somewhere between the main gear, you can consider that a good landing. If you touch down though, and the center line is outside of the confines of the main gear, that's not such a good landing. 
Adding factors like weather in mean you have to manipulate the control inputs to make sure the aircraft lands pointed down the runway. In a crosswind, this may mean using rudder to point the nose down the runway just before touchdown. With so many factors in landing, this video could span for a while. For now, let's leave it with just basic principles and techniques to help you get the most out of every landing, and later we can break down the more specific items like a crosswind or even an instrument approach leading to a landing. Hope you guys learned from the video, and don't hesitate to leave your feedback in the comments sections. Give us a thumbs up if you enjoyed the video, and as always, thanks for watching, and until next time.